then we will, will have uh, two discussions. The first discussion, we have uh, Professor Hermin Shou. Professor Hermin Shou now is the director of the uh, Council of the Social Science, National Science uh, Council, right? And also a very uh, famous uh, uh, environmental sociologist uh, in the Department of the Sociology in the National Taiwan University. Uh, Min Shou, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I, I'm Min Xiu, I'm a sociologist, so um, I'm more coming from a, a background of environmental movement study, rather than environmental governance. So that's why I learned a lot from, from your talk today. And also I had the pleasure of, of reading your three of your article, uh, the risk production and analysis yesterday. So. It's really informative. So uh, today I have, I was told that I will have 15 minutes. So I'm going to share with what I learned today and from your talk. Uh, uh, first of all, I, I like your uh, model of uh, post-normal politics or post-normal uh, risk governance very much. I think it's broad and general, and I think it's sufficiently large so that we can deal with a lot of new challenges, new unknown whether these risks are man-made or not. Uh, I think that's, that, that, the, the scope of it is, is something very, very uh, fascinating. And then second, uh, I also like the way that you, uh, that you base your framework in a number of sociological theories. Uh, I think it's solid the basic theory. Uh, I, I say that because I'm, I often have to teach sociological theory in my department. And I'm really, really glad that the name that you, you mentioned in your slide that uh, indicate that this theory, although are very abstract, but do they do have, uh, I mean, uh, policy implication, the way in which that we try to deal with a, uh, a problem at our hand, and these are the principles that we can often come back to when we face this challenge. And although I, I think I'm very sympathetic to to, to your effort to make this framework a, a workable formula uh, when we are dealing with uh, uh, new, new challenges that is always always coming as we can expect. And also I have a feeling that the, 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 the theory, the model you talk is more normative rather than descriptive. It's more an ideal uh, or something that we should strive forward and also there is certain distance from what you have described, uh, from what we are right now, so it's more like blueprint. But I, I think I, I think my question later on will be more concentrated on that. So I really want to I really want to hear more. How do we move from your ideal blueprint to the reality? And knowing that actually what we have and where we stand is very problematic. And as for an uh, well, also, I, I particularly like uh, the way that you try to uh, provide a typology of uncertainties. I think there are four uncertainties there. And also, there, I also see that there is a correspondence between the four typology of uncertainties and the four uh, authority, according to the term you use. I think there is a correspondence there. And I think these are very useful tools for cognitive mapping especially when we are facing a new challenge. So the uncertainty could be about our knowledge, or about the entity, or about the way that we discuss it. I think these are very useful when we, next time when we have a new challenge like pandemic or whatever. Uh, so at least it's a very useful analytical tool. But also I have a question that, so it's a very, two very small questions. So what do you, my, my, my what puzzles me is that why do you use the term authorities? So it seems to me that it's more like a division within the government. So what, is, what I think, I think uh, what you try to outline is more like an arena of activities or interchanges or engagement that's spending across a boundary between state and non-state. But, but, but I, I try to really try to struggle with the term of authority. And also, I'm curious about why you use the term uh, teleological. Whereas uh, you, uh, I think 
in, in, that, in that area the teleological uncertainties and also teleological authority. I think you try to, I think what you refer to is more like an implementa implementation side. Uh, the way how we do, how we carry out, how we implement, how we execute the policy. So, so teleological is really a big word for me. So, so it's curious how, why you use this term. Okay, that, that's, that, uh, overall, I, I, I think I, I like your uh, framework, and I think it's a very informative, and also it's very theory-based. And, and two questions uh, I want to further engage with you are related to science and democracy. I think that's really our two guiding principles that you try to uh, combine here in this framework. So science, of course, is a poem because it's an activity that produces new knowledge. And new knowledge is supposedly uh, the, uh, supposed to present a new understanding so that we can reduce uncertainty. But oftentimes, we knew that with the accumulation of scientific knowledge, the, the realm of unknown actually increased. So there's a dialectic process, uh, process in that. So my, my question is more focusing on the, the science and its it's low, it's, it's low in a in broader society, especially in the, the relationship with the lay knowledge, uh, lay person knowledge that you talk about a lot. Uh, so uh, I think we were kind of, it's been like a half century before we talk, uh, after we talk about public understanding of science. So the efforts are to popular, popularize, to, to, uh, to make science finding more communicative to everyone have been there for many years. And also, I think with a lot of uh, new scholarship, especially in the camp of SDS, I think we learn a lot of, know that science actually is activity that produce within the society. So a lot of uh, scholarly uh, uh, output try to contextualize, demystify science. Uh, it's, it's more like a process rather than an authority that is not based on Earth. But I have a feeling that our age is full of widespread skepticism and unfounded conspiracy theories. And especially, we just ended the COVID, but during the COVID, we see a lot of like virus denialism, uh, vaccine skepticism, and all kinds of cons conspiracy theories that have been uh, circulated there. And also, we know that we are, what we have is an age of uh, social media, so it's kind of a turbocharged viral information flow that is being circulated there. And also, in addition to that, we know that uh, dictators are trying to, were trying to like, weaponize the information flow. So that what we have is like, in addition to misinformation, we have disinformation. And we have all this, uh, so, so, so like, like we talk, we say that pandemics actually uh, give rise to infodemics. So instead of a virus circulating a lot, we have false information that is spreading around. So, so with all that understanding, so I'm really curious about, uh, so the idea was like, I, what I see in your model is that you try to uh, build an environment so that a science, a scientific uh, discovery authority can have a dialogue with a person and can, they can have a public negotiation or dialogue in, in, in certain form. But, what I saw right now is like a backlash. And people don't really want science. They want partisanship. They want something that to their liking. So I, really, I think we're really living in a crazy age. So I want to hear you more about that. And the second point is about democracy. I think you mentioned that in your last page and about some reforms, advancement, uh, liberal democracy. And I'm really curious about that, especially when you talk about cosmopolitanization. Uh, I mention this because I think we were also living in an age where angry nationalistic backlash are surging everywhere in the world. We have xenophobic populism, we have anti foreignism we have all sorts of crazy stuff that's been circulating around, and even Europe is a big trouble right now. Um, that really speaks to the I think one of the big problems that liberal democracy is facing right now, we have too much partisanship, we have uh, worsening polarization, we have intolerance rising everywhere in the world that make our institution more fragile and, and, content and contentious. So, 
So, but when we talk about risk, uh, uh, like violence, it could be a common threat, common enemy to all. Whereas uh, that require a, a, a unity or solidarity that people should do something together because you are like combating an enemy, or even though the enemy is always often invisible. You you have to build minimum uh, consensus like during the pandemic. There are a lot of controversy, in, in especially in, in North America and in Europe, whether we should implement mandate mask wearing or, or vaccine and, and also lockdown and, and so on. This, this, this anti-virus uh, anti measures are all in controversial. So I really, I, I think it, it speaks to a lot of going problem that we see right now in the, in the world that is, is democracy really up to the challenge of, 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 of making it possible to act together to come back to a, a thing and then, so that's what I'm, I'm curious about. So uh, in general, I'd love you to elaborate more what you, you've been discussed in the last page about the democracy. So that's my two comments, and, uh, and so I end here. And, it's, and again, I, I would really learn a lot from your presentation. I'm looking forward to have dialogue with you. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, these very constructive remarks. Uh, I appreciate them highly uh, because this is this dialogue among us is that what what I try to, to integrate in my thinking and, and the further development of that of that concept. Um, yes, it might look in the... I go a little bit through uh, in the sequence that you mentioned the things and come then on, uh, to your questions. Just two to, 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 um, uh, remarks, two to comments that you made. Of course, it might look like a little bit in the presentation that the concept is uh, more normative than descriptive. So, yeah, I should have better explained the descriptive nature is more, in a way, the things to which I refer. I have to dis make them descriptive to, to be able to apply them to my conceptualization. So I would, if I have to emphasize it, it's normative and functional, yeah, because I'm also interested in, in a higher functionality of democracy in that way. Yeah. Um, the correspondence between the typology of the post-normal approach and the uncertainty is uh, is a random or not, and not. <laughs> and it's a, a long-term process of my own thinking. Um, originally it started and that also triggered my thinking about that I do more on uncertainty was I was thinking what is it actually uh, when we, ten years ago when we write down this uh, governance approaches to risk, so integrating risk assessment, risk perception, risk characterization, evaluation, management, communication, etc. What does it actually mean? Which kind of issues are behind the risk phenomena? And especially with regard to the mental and social construction of the people who are affected by the risks, and then we have other perceptions, often by stakeholders, and often even a different one than by uh, the policy makers and uh, the political decision makers. So what is behind that? And, and of course it is obvious that we have to deal with epistemic uh, issues, which are uh, the things, this is our core business to produce knowledge in any way. So it means that we have to refer, if possible, still to the natural scientific assessments that if they are available for risks and, and or I should, it's always difficult what do I say first risk or uncertainty because my thinking has turned it around that I see uncertainty first but for the um, tailoring post-normal governance approaches I would still say we have to look at the risk phenomena itself and then look at different uh, appearances, different guises of, uh, of uncertainty that come along with that, that have to be addressed, which are one of the big problems in the past that we did not properly address that. So it has a kind of uh, incremental evolution back forth and, um, from the uncertainty 
the, uh, uh, to the post normal. In the book, I do not yet go into governance at all, so it's really rather uh, a theoretical effort to, to find a better differentiation. Of course, with the background, how can that be used later, and does it make sense? So you, you cannot just create a taxonomy for the sake of fun. It does not make, it does not help to anything. It's nice to do that, but well, you can do it for, for yourself and maybe even for publication. But it is rather here something, because we don't have something which differentiates difference uncertainty. Only within epistemology we have here different things. That's also what uh, the colleagues uh, Fantowitz and Roberts did, and others, Giddens, Audrey, and myself. So we tried to figure that out. But I, I was then thinking that is not enough. So what we think when we discuss in governance, risk governance, what, what kind of risks are acceptable for society. We do not ask about the quantity uh, or the magnitude or probability so much. We often discuss, is this something that society accepts even if we have maybe high criteria with regard to that. So for many years it was accepted for uh, nuclear energy in Germany. Yeah. Even then it turned that the public was against it, but the government still continued to do that. And then there was a sudden uh, a change of mind through uh, Fukushima. After Fukushima, that we phased out of nuclear energy in, uh, at all. <clears throat> so it's a little bit, these kind of questions are behind that. And that's what I mean with ontological uncertainty. Often all this cannot be solved but we have to be aware of it. We have to bring it into our public policies because people often don't see what yesterday some said. We do not have any more this kind of narratives which explain us in a little bit more an ordinary language why we are uh, complying with that. Why do we are complying with democracy and all the things that we think the discussion was in the last couple of years, oh, the autocratic systems are much better in fast dealing with risk. That is not true. So if we look at the studies that we have right now, so and that the democratic systems are at the end much more solid and more long-lasting with regard to the management of risks than autocratic systems. This we, don't, we do not only see that in the context of the COVID pandemic or a lot of other risks as well. But this was the discussion, so we need to talk a little bit more. What are the fundamentals of our human existence? What do we want? What kind of society do we want? What kind of organization, that's what I mean with this term, organization of social being. How shall it be organized in what way? So how do we address many of these risks are uh, associated with a series of other risks that often not mentioned with poverty, with our class system in societies, with hierarchies, with power, and many such things, and the misuse of risk uh, and such things. So this has to be discussed much more with what I mean with ontological authority. So it was a back and forth between that, and, and I'm, uh, um, of course, because I, I identified that there are three, four major issues that have to be addressed with risk and uncertainty, and that's why I came to the conclusion to differentiate that in that way, that also the governance has to address it more in that way. This does not mean that you would then neglect the other things. That's why I try to emphasize it has to be built up as a little bit a process step by step and advancing you know, in that way. Um, so one of your first questions, why did I use the term authority is a good question. I still struggling with it. I use it in the early versions when I presented that and wrote that down. I was much more careful. But in the meantime, the more I think what we really need as the future of our democracies is, in my view, that this has to be institutionalized. And that's why I came to a much stronger word, which has already political connotations. We are uh, uh, having a lot of associations with authority, but I think we have to create these new authorities. And I know there is a lot of resistance, in, in especially uh, with regard in the practitioners of representative democracies, because they would lose power 
they would lose a lot of these activities that they do. But I see it in the future as something that has to be much more institutional. It has to be become common as you would go every four years to the elections, that you have chances to get involved. That means, that's what I wanted to say, it should not be only informal. The Germans have now, after this uh, drama at the uh, train station underground in Stuttgart, this is what is called, <coughs> you have heard about this, Wutbürger, the, the citizens who are angry. Um, so after that, the day established all over Germany for many, many things, this, this public participation and so But it's everywhere, it's only informal and not statutory. And that's the big problem. It's depending on the government to say, oh, we do it now. And they often do it because they think, this was the discussion yesterday as well, to rebuild trust, which we do not yet know. Of course, it, the underlying assumption is that with post-normal approach, we can regain the trust. But we need empirical studies to really to prove that. It's just now a working hypothesis that, that I can make, but I have to be very careful to say that. But this is at the moment one of our only path to regain in the democratic processes the trust that we need, that we see is even increasing. And my problem is even if we have so many of this public deliberation in the last 20 years since I do research on it, the, the trust is still going down. It's not really, it has not been maintained or uh, uh, being uh, at the same level, it's going down. And that has more to do, I think, with our democratic system at all. And that has to be discussed. And of course, uh, there can be other opinions and other concepts. My approach to is that this kind of post-normal approach has to be much more constitutionalized. I don't want to say that we have to copy what they do in Switzerland. I lived in Switzerland for five years. They have maybe the most advanced deliberative democracy elements in constitutionalized and institutionalized in, in a country. But they have a special situation, which is different. I would not totally copy it. But they have a lot of these deliberative possibilities all the time. And then it ends up in referendums that the, the, the people really vote for a specific, uh, the, on specific question, yes or no, what they want. I do not say that we have to copy it that way, but I want to have this post-normal approach that the public, the ordinary citizen, and the stakeholders have a chance to, to get engaged and take their results of discussion seriously is institutionalized as we have institutionalized our permanent and regular elections. So how we do that, that can be discussed. I, well, I have not yet any concrete solutions. I have some, but this depends a lot on the structures and constitutions of the countries that it might be different in Canada than in Taiwan or in Germany. Yeah. Um, well, of course, uh, this the, the your point of science and democracy. This is all in that under that umbrella to be seen. Yeah, this discussion, and I think that is the one of the strong uh, forces in democracies that we rely on science. An autocratic system, as you mentioned, don't have to do that. So, and we have a tendency in many countries and. You have to enlighten me on how it is going in, in Taiwan. And so especially that now this post-truth, post-facticity is created and many people take that. And it is really, it is hard to, to work against that, that they see this as alternative facts, which is uh, already in the wording totally wrong and not, not possible. But it has been uh, announced by a secretary of Trump, and since then it's everywhere, everyone is using that. It's used in Germany uh, now in this queer movement and, and the movement against COVID regulations, and now it's against climate implementation and regulation. So they jump from one train on the next to, to uh, um, it's very difficult because they have so many dimensions and don't want to be uh, just say one dimension because it would be very short sighted. But it has to do with that there seems to be a part of our society is so unhappy, I use very common language here, with the democratic political system that they just want to go against them and in resistance to everything. It doesn't matter anymore if this is rational or unreasonable. 
And so the discussions a lot in Germany and a little bit in Canada and especially in the US about is there still a discourse in the sense of how Roma is possible with them or because it starts that they get excluded, which is also not the right way. There is a part you cannot talk with them anymore. It's not possible they don't listen to anything. They just then give you some paroles and some phrases and that's all. So and they repeat that here, like Trump. If it, he said that one in an interview, if you repeat a, a, a lie three times, the people start believing it. You have just to say it three times in a kind of uh, um, a syntactical way then it, and semantic way, then it's working relatively easy. This we know, unfortunately, this is uh, German history, which we know from Hitler, and all this has started there, this kind of manipulation through the language and the communication. So, of course, here, science and democracy, science is the, uh, democracy is the conveyor for science, for science producing that. So, because we have countries where they do not take that as seriously as we do, and, and, and it, it's good to hear that I learned yesterday from Kuei Tian that you are having strong co collaboration with other democracy in Asia. You don't have much these countries, so, but you have strong co co uh, 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 collaborations with Japan and South Korea. Of course, we should not exclude the others, especially those who are uh, in more transition periods that they have seen well, how effective but, and how successful democr uh, democratic processes and, and its science behind it can be. Um, yes, the conspiracy theories is a big issue. I, in the book, under the category of linguistic communicative uncertainty, I have at the end, because it's theory, I uh, added to each main uh, type of uncertainty what I called an excursus to illustrate that more. And here I use the issue how the language is misused through uh, ideologies, especially I referring to Russia and China, but also to the big issues of the conspiracy theories that are also used by ideologies in which popped up. So we all know this about QN, which is now, it's there, it's not going away anymore. They jump from one thing to another. It's a kind of umbrella uh, conspiracy theory under which everything is more or less subsumed. So this is a big issue and will be, uh, again, a big challenge for our discursive nature of our democracies. How, what, how do we do it? Do we invite them? We have to invite them. Otherwise, we become, at that moment, undemocratic. We, if we exclude specific parts of the society. On the other way, if you sit together with them, you cannot have a real argumentative exchange. Either they do not take part, or they will not follow. So you cannot even create a common denominator on which you can start arguing about, let's say, ontological issues that would be uh, important uh, for uh, uh, governance. And that's the, the, the big challenge. Nobody has a real uh, solution for that, so, but we have to do research on it and find out. We have to do experiments with them, without them. So even, well, even if I'm against it, but we have to try out what it means if we exclude them from many uh, decision making, which is already happening more incrementally, but it's happening in countries like US, Canada, and, 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 and Germany. Yeah, I can observe that. So. Um, Yes, um, the dialogue of science and public is extremely important. It, when I started uh, uh, 30 years ago um, uh, uh, working as scientist, there was not so much. It was the first kind of steps into that that we always say, oh, we have to look, um, because I worked for a scientific advisory body already at that time, that we have to look to formulate at least the recommendations in a way that go towards more public understanding. But over the years, I, I came to the conclusion on the basis of a lot of, of research and that it's not only that we are able to translate, even if I said this here, but this is a little bit short, of course, uh, and you have a specific frame to present it, that the first step is to translate it into a public um, language. Um, and that can be done in a first step by epistemic authorities. But this is not all. 
So in one of my articles that I mentioned, uh, uh, listed here, that I tried to figure that out. And the idea is more that uh, the creation of public understanding has to be done with the public so that they participate in the new language formulation and communication. Because then it has a much better basis. So you need to do a post-normal approach to find public understanding as well, especially with such things. There were so many mistakes that made in the early stages of the climate science. So that's why are we also so delayed, because people, even close, my close friends in Germany, some of them don't believe that this uh, uh, climate uh, is changing in that way. So they just want to ignore it, yeah, in that way. And that is difficult, that has to do that we did not enough at the very beginning from my perspective. And that has to be better done and be integrated into it for all our future risks that we have to, to communicate. We have to do much more on biodiversity that is so closely linked to climate change. And this is our next big global challenge uh, um, that has to be addressed. Cosmopolitanization, yes, I have a new project which is funded by the uh, Social Science and uh, uh, Humanities Research Council in Canada on the way. I use the term by Ulrich Beck <coughs> because to make it, uh, you always have to make it attractive for the reviewers and for the funders in a way that you get funded. Well, we all know that. I would have done formulated another way if that would be not necessary. But I used it and I like it in a way because Ulrich Beck's kind of conclusions is that we need new analytical entities and units to find that. Yeah. And he gave some examples in his latest books. I'm not so absolutely convinced about the examples of what that he used. But they play a role, but I see much more that we need this new analytical um, uh, units and they can be, um, we can uh, uh, here uh, touch base on that what is done in specific parts of international relations research already, namely on transnational governance, what is mostly called, or, and stakeholder involvement at a transnational level. So here we can use that. So, I, I, so cosmopolitanization, I see, I use that word with, with the N, not like back to cosmopolitization. This is now a very theoretical, philosophical discussion because I want to emphasize the process. And I think the tonization emphasizes the process more than that we will see a static end, a final goal. I don't like that in that way because I see that as an endless process. And we can define new goals whenever we need that. And we do not know and should not give them uh, a, a, a kind of demarcation at the end. I don't like that. And I don't want to come away a little bit from that what is in philosophy very popular is to say about this word citizenship, which is uh, created by Kant and then used by many philosophers, contemporary philosophers right now. I want to, uh, in this article that I just uh, have to write the conclusions and I hope it will be accepted in a journal is I try to develop a new critical methodology of the cosmopolitan so I avoided the title all of this is this cosmopolitan methodology or the other way around and this just the cosmopolitan has to be careful at the first because I want to say okay what my suggestion is we need a kind of approach we have a lot of theories and visions by Beck and philosophers in political science in, in sociology, and then we need now an, a kind of work on the operationalization, and then we need the analytical units. What do we analyze and then can evaluate and interpret it as advancement steps towards cosmopolitan? And I see that, for example, things that would be similar to the post-normal approach, namely transnational governance approaches, where the governments are not so dominant anymore, where stakeholders and even public might be integrated in the policy, international policy making process. We have some examples, they are still rare, they are still the minority, but we have examples and we can learn from that. Maybe the, the largest, the biggest example unique in the world is a bilateral one. I did uh, a, a long term research, it was on my PhD very early on. It's on the Great Lakes environmental policy on the Great Lakes between Canada and US. They have created, okay, they have specific conditions in their countries which are very similar, which made it easy. But they have 
uh, a five steps, uh, four steps uh, uh, kind of higher, uh, uh, system scheme where they do expert deliberation, stakeholder deliberation in different ways and at different socio-political level and general public uh, uh, participation in different ways. And this is the most advanced one in the world. And they have good, made good success, they are having problems right now in the last 10 years, but this depends uh, or is a result of other issues. So we have examples. Another one, and that was the choice of the ocean as an example, an empirical example. It's a vehicle for me, an empirical vehicle, because I thought I have to learn just from back what is a global issue that nobody can ignore anymore in that way. And in a, in a way, we're all affected by, in, directly or indirectly, by issues of oceans. Oceans play such a major role, not only their environment and their health, uh, or with regard to food, with regard to globalization, transportation, and in the last couple of years also security. And so it's everywhere. So and that's why I choose that as an example. And we have, for example, a new kind of post uh, uh, transnational governance where stakeholders are involved, which is called regional marine forums for the Atlantic, and they're establishing right now something for the Indian Ocean. There might be something being established in a couple of years here for South East Asia as well. So I have three elements that uh, is important for me for the cosmopolitanization. So this is that, this kind of forms that uh, emerge somewhere, and we have to analyze them properly. We don't have any surveys that compare them each other or even and do uh, an overarching survey, where do we all have this kind of forms at all? The, this is one dimension. The other dimension is this, where are, in different socio-political levels, down to the local democracies, where is where our cosmopolitan horizons are discussed? In a way, how do uh, ordinary people develop cosmopolitan attitudes, beliefs, and a kind of ethos. Yeah, that they think, okay, we cannot ignore anymore when we talk about climate change and say, oh, it's only relevant for Taiwan. Well, I still have that problem with my province, Newfoundland, that they're often too much thinking provincially, which is a big issue. So I want to see, we can measure that through, through perception studies, through through interviews to find out and, and, and study their, their attitudes. We do that in sociology. We did that with regard to risk uh, uh, over many years in different fields. I think we, we can do that in that way as well for co the cosmopolitan. So that was the second one. And the third one is to think in a way uh, these transnational public spheres. So of course we have a much stronger one in the European Union, but also it is very issue specific. It's not a general one. Yeah? But we see some, some uh, emergences of that over the world. And the best example is the, the climate research. We need something for that with regard to biodiversity or other things. We have it a little bit with regard to world economy, but this is often too much forced and driven um, by the economists themselves, or the bankers, or the, the politicians who deal uh, with the economic issues. So, and here, we need such, because my understanding is, that's why I emphasize that as, a, as the first one, is only when that works well, the rest is not easy, but better be uh, institutionalized, the other authorities, when that works, because this is, the fundamental uh, 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 breeding ground for me in democracies. Without public sphere, it doesn't work. In China, we don't have a public sphere in that way. Yeah, or in other autocratic systems. That's why they have these big problems also to to organize themselves. I just observed that in Thailand now, uh, they had the elections in May. So, and it was that they created, and this is only in the aftermath to be observed, they created a new public sphere via social media. And that was possible only within one year that they shaped new parties, which are now the majority parties. So it's an interesting thing, and I think that can uh, occur transnationally. So in specific, with regard to specific issues. So these are the three dimensions with regard to the cosmopolitanization. Well, 
you mentioned partisanship and, and, and um, uh, I try to make it short polarization. This is a big challenge and I have no answer to that. But I think I still convinced uh, personally and rationally um, um, about this, that the discourse is the, the ultimate vehicle in our democracies. And only the, the way that we sit down and uh, find a culture even that we don't have to agree at the end, but that we sit down and exchange the arguments and listen to each other. Because at the moment, we have a new culture where we don't listen to each other anymore, especially also between parties. So this is extreme in the US between Republicans and Democrats, but it also starts more and more uh, in Germany. That was not the, the, the way uh, uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago. They respected each other very well and exchanged arguments, and, and, and that is something which also, of course, the ordinary people will observe that, and then they say, oh, when they do, we can do the same. That, that happened also with Trump in the US. So we, this is a kind of role model, the democracy, and if the, those who are responsible for that do not their proper job in that and create a kind of anti-discourse culture, then we should not wonder that that is reflected uh, in the people uh, behavior and uh, their uh, communication. Yeah, I am talking too long, so <laughs> I should stop. <laughs>